Hey man, welcome to the inaugural edition of Silent Bob Speaks with Kevin Smith. Can't believe it took me that long to figure out a title for these. Um, uh, normally, I kind of just put things under Fat Man Beyond or, or just throw them up. Now, anytime I'm sitting here talking to camera, we got a name for it. It's a name that's been around for a long ass time. Um, okay, but on this inaugural edition, man, I'm going to review Spider-Man colon Far From Home. Uh, you can watch me and Mark Bernard and review Spider-Man Far From Home on Fat Man Beyond, which goes up tomorrow. Uh, we did it at uh, Scum and Villainy and everybody was there. Every we took everybody to see the movie uh, at a Screen X uh, viewing of the flick where the movie wraps around you. It's awesome. Um, and then we all sat around and talked about it and stuff. So you can watch me and Mark talk about it and all the folks uh, at the cantina who were there for the show uh, talk about it tomorrow. Today, I'm going to give you my one-on-one -on -one right here, man, with the very first uh, Silent Bob Speaks. Branding, kids. Okay, so before we do that, a uh, little housekeeping uh, just to you know pay the bills and stuff. Here we go. If you're going to Comic-Con, the San Diego Comic-Con, Comic-Con International, it's San Diego, a celebration of the popular arts. Um, I'll be there this year, uh, as I have been for the last three years, sitting uh, in back at a Hall H, and back at a, the entire convention center, uh, in the water, uh, on the IMD boat, where I'm going to be interviewing my, my uh, pop culture betters uh, all weekend long and stuff. And then, on Saturday, the 20th, night of the 20th, I have my panel on, in Hall H, right after the Marvel panel. So, fuck. Um, you know, what am I going to say after that? I'll tell you what I'm going to say after that, man. I'm going to show you a trailer. I'm going to bring the Jay and Silent Bob reboot trailer with me. And I'm going to bring Jay with me as well. And we're going to show you a scene from the movie. You know, because the trailer will go up online. But this scene from the movie, we're only if you're in Hall H, you're going to see it. If not, you see it when you finally see the movie when it comes out. So uh, that's what I'm doing in, in San Diego. And then uh, lastly, Hollywood Babylon with me and Ralph Garman uh, returns to the improv uh, on uh, Saturday, July 27th, week after Comic-Con. All right, so there's some housekeeping for you. Uh, let's dive in. I've seen Spider-Man uh, Far From Home twice now. First time I saw it uh, in Screen X. Uh, the good folks at Screen X uh, set up a screening for us uh, and had a absolute blast. Um, it was only like five of us in the theater. It was a private screening. So second time I watched it, cause before I like to review stuff or this is barely a review, uh, this is a recap really. Um, I like to make sure I see it again. So I remember everything cause I'm blazed most of the time. So I want to make sure I get details. So I went to see it when I was in, um, Cleveland. I just went to Cleveland to do a show at Youngstown state uh, university in Ohio. So I was in Cleveland the night before. I said, fuck it, man. I'm going to go see Spider-Man uh, in that morning. So I went in the morning to check it out, and it was a 10 o'clock screening. So, you know, I was, there's this no slam whatsoever on, on, you know, where I was in the world and stuff like that. But, you know, before you go do a show, I was going to go do a show in Youngstown. You look it up. So you're like, oh, what can I talk about? You know, you just don't want to hit the stage dry and be like, fucking goes on here. You know, you want to have a working familiarity so you could be like, hello, Cleveland, or something like that. So I looked up Youngstown and in its Wikipedia breakdown, like there's a section that you rarely see for most cities said crime. And I was like, that's funny. And I clicked on it and it said at the base of the heading of, the, of everything, there's a lot of information in it. And it said, Youngstown is the ninth most dangerous city in the United States. Not in Ohio, in the United States. So I was like, oh, that's, I had no idea that's where I was. So I didn't want to leave my laptop in my hotel room. So I brought my laptop with me in a bag. No judgment against the hotel or the people and staff at the hotel. They were all wonderful. But, you know, number nine in a nationwide, like that's big number. Um, so I was like, you know what, just in case somebody decides to get into my room, let me take my laptop. Laptop's got scripts I'm working on, it's got the movies, it's, it's everything, right? So take the laptop, I put it in my bag. I'm not gonna just carry the laptop, so I put it in my, my bag. I got a Zach and Mary make a porno like bag from when we wrapped the movie. So put it in that, got some room in the bag. So I'm like, fuck it, I'm going to the movie theater, man. I'm gonna bring some snacks. So I brought some 
vegan snacks. I'm vegan. I don't know if you know this, but I'm vegan. Um, so I went and got some snacks at Whole Foods because if you go get the snacks in the movie theater, generally speaking, they don't have, you know, vegan options. Uh, and I'm not like, I ain't cheap. I'm happy to pay whatever they charge me in the movie theater. But if you have the snacks, if you have my brands, I'd be buying y'all snacks. But if not, you know, since I'm bringing a bag already, I'm like, all right, I'll bring because it was early in the morning. I said, I'll bring some stuff because I eat at noon. I know people are like, get to the review, you fat piece of shit. They don't say that anymore. Get to the review, you dumb piece of shit. You're formerly fat piece of shit. Um, so I, I had some snacks in the bag, packed some snacks in and stuff. And I go to the movie. You know, got my ticket, went inside. It was packed. I had to sit between people. Um, it was layback recliner, so it was totally fine. To my right, there's a lady right next to her some older dude, like, in his 30s. To my left, there's a little kid, you know, eight, nine, maybe 10 or something. I can't judge that kind of thing. He was just a small person, uh, like, young. Hidden next to him is his mom. Next to the mom is the other brother. She keeping them apart. It was, I will say, it was adorable. Spoilers, at one point when Spider-Man and MJ, spoilers, finally kiss, the kid next to me went nuts. Like, but not in the fanboy way like I did. My heart soared. But this kid was like, ah! And he squirmed and literally put his face into his mother. I was like, wow, man. I remember those days. Um, so there I am getting ready to watch a movie. They're putting up the trailers, man. They're playing a Goldfinch trailer. And I'm like, how the fuck are they going to adapt this book? Like, look at that shit. Oh, they're doing it. It's that Ansel boy. Ansel, what's his fuck? And I'm watching the trailer. And all of a sudden, flashlight goes in my face. And the security guard is standing in front of me. And he goes, uh, hi, uh, what's in the bag? And I was like, what, this bag? I was like, ah, and I felt fucking caught, man. Like really fucking caught. Like I wasn't expecting that. And I, you know, I was, it was weird. What was weirder was remember the guy who was sitting next to the lady I talked about? About five minutes prior to this, like he was staring at me hardcore before like the trailers popped in. And, you know, I was just like, that happens because, like, oh, you know, I dress like fucking Silent Bob every day in my life. So with a backwards baseball cap, people are like, oh, it's that fucking, hey, it's Kevin James. So I thought I got recognized, quasi-recognized, you know. And so I didn't, every time I looked over, my man would, like, look away and shit like that. So I thought, like, oh, I'm used to this. I know this game. I've done this a zillion times. So that guy got up at one point, like, just when the trailers began. I just marked it. I don't know why, because he was looking at me when he got up. And then security dude like comes in and kind of look in the bag. And I'm like, what? Why? Why am I? Who the fuck would profile me? Like fucking, do I look like someone who's here to start some shit? I look like fucking Kevin James, man. So, uh, you know, I'm like fucking nervous because I got a bunch of snacks in my bag too. So I'm like, oh shit. So I'm like, I thought for a second, maybe that's what he was asking me about. I'm like, these motherfuckers are so tight with the no snacks policy. Jesus Christ. Um, I go, my, my laptop. And he goes, may I see it? And I said, uh, okay. And so I unzip the back pocket. That's where the laptop is. And he looks in with a flashlight. And he goes, okay, thank you. And then walks away. And I was like, that's so fucked up. Like me, of it, like... I, there's a lady with a purse. Like, there are people all over. Then the dude who got up, he comes and sits down. And that's when I put it together, man. My man profiled me and was like, there's a loner nutbag who came in just before the movie began. He's got a bag in his lap. And he looks awfully suspect. And they fucking, they thought I might be trouble. Me, of all people, man. Meanwhile, the fucking kid next to me, the little kid is staring at me suddenly because he's like, the worst thing in the world you can do in front of a child is have security come up to you because now this kid's like, you're suspect. And so, you know, a couple minutes into the movie and shit, I flip the bag around and I go open it up real quietly and slowly because I'm reaching in to get my fucking snacks, man. The movie's underway. There's a nice kind of loud sequence, so I'm like, they won't hear the crinkling of the bag. I reach in to get these, these whole foods like uh, peanut butter snacks I got. And as I pull out, my bag's open. I look over and the kid next to me has just seen the wealth of snacks in my bag and he's wide-eyed and he looks up at me and I look at him and he goes, I'm telling the man. And I was like, no, 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 please don't. This is all before the movie begins, an adventure before the movie. So his mother tells him to leave me alone. We go back to watching the fucking flick. 
I'm eating my snacks. Loving this film. Second time I saw it. Let's jump into it. Look, before we recap the movie in order of things of how they happen, this is generally what I try to do is just retell the story. Um, I got to jump. Look, like here, let's do this. A preview before the review or a precap before the recap. Um, not only is this uh, one of the best superhero movies ever made, not only is this pure cinematic joy uh, along the order of, uh, you know, Empire Strikes Back or Raiders of the Lost Ark, same feelings I had when I saw those movies in a the movie theater when I was a kid. Not only is this movie a time machine to a better time of your life, this movie plays like a happy childhood. Not only does this movie capture everything that movies are supposed to be about, escape, wonder, adventure, heroism, drama, characters. Um, not only is it Avengers 1.5 in as much as it dovetails directly off of Endgame and shows us what the Marvel Universe looks like today now that, you know, spoilers, Tony Stark has given his life. And I should say before we go any deeper into this, spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. We're going to like spoil the shit out of Spider-Man Far From Home. So if you're watching this and you haven't seen the movie, stop. Go see the movie. Come back. Continue watching this. Not only is this movie one of my favorite Marvel movies ever made, not only uh, does this movie manage to not only, uh, you know, uh, uh, make Endgame tastier somehow, and Endgame was a tasty buffet, not only does this movie, Spider-Man Far From Home, add a flavor to that buffet. Just when you thought, you're like, oh, I've had everything on the buffet. They bring out a steam tray full of like fucking fried gold. Not only does this movie accomplish all of those miracles um, and stand out as one of the best summer movies I've ever seen in my life, just when the credits roll on this fucker and you're like, fuck, I feel bad for the next fucking movie. has got to follow this shit. Jesus. This got me shooting my webs all over the joint. Then this movie somehow bests itself by coming up with a mid credit sequence that is as dazzling, spellbinding, game-changing, dramatic, uh, adventurous, uh, escapist, it does the entire job that the movie just did for like two hours and then does it again in the span of like two minutes. In that two minutes, they somehow made a movie that was better than the amazing movie that they just showed us for two hours. Can you imagine that? You get done with the feat of a lifetime where you're like, look at this. Not only is it like the fucking umpteenth Spider-Man movie, but it's amazing, pun intended. And it ain't amazing like the other one. It's it is described as amazing. It's not in the title. Um, not only did they stick the landing, man, they, 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 they Peter tingled all of us. They, they tingled all our Peters, man. It was, a, it was fantastic. It, it made me go, I stood up and I applauded. So John Watts is director for the ages. That was with the movie proper. And then, you know, I'm like, all right, man, show us. So I can't wait to see what the post-credit sequence, the mid-credit sequence is going to be. And they show you a mid-credit sequence that changes the entire face of the fucking Marvel Universe going forward. Changes everything you thought you knew about what would be next for Spider-Man. I was having a fucking blast in these movies, man. They got high school right. These Spider-Man movies have been a couple of pitch perfect high school movies. They're so good. You know how something is, you know, you know how you know something's good if you're creative yourself or if you fancy yourself creative? You see it and it makes you want to do something like it. Now, Seeing Spider-Man uh, Homecoming and Far From Home didn't make me want to make a superhero movie. I don't have the talent for that. But it made me want to make a high school movie so badly. Th this kid and his team of writers knocked it out the park both times with movies that are set in fucking high school. It's difficult, man. Particularly, like, any capture in the tone of high school and a, and a teenager is difficult in any period of time, let alone right now in this period of time, let alone when that's not even the main story. The main story is, by the way, this teenager puts on a suit, shoots webs, and he's fucking the amazing Spider-Man. Or your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. So they're making these perfect, pitch perfect fucking high school movies. And as we come into a close 
with with Spider-Man Far From Home and you know you got uh, Peter and MJ coming off the plane in Newark, New Jersey, mind you. As a fucking New Jersey person, oh my God, that made me so happy. When I was a kid, anytime they put New Jersey in the movies, I'd go ape shit. It doesn't change when you're 48, even though you've put Jersey in movies your whole fucking career. I saw it say, Newark, New Jersey. I was like, fucking been there. I've been there. I exist in the same world as these Spider-Man characters. And I know that because they put Marvel, put Marvel put mall rats in Captain America. So I know I exist in this universe. I could have passed those kids post blip, if you will. Who knew, man? So that's happening. They, they show the kids starting to hold hands. They play another Ramones song, and you're like, oh, shit, I like this, man. They're like bringing us into a a close, a landing the same way they brought the other one in for a landing, man. Like, fucking, there's a Ramones song, it's high school life. You know, I'm like, I'm looking forward to next one, uh, next year, where we get to see Peter in his senior year, because they've let Peter Parker be, uh, you know, a teenager, a kid, and that's that's what, these have been so much better than the other Spider-Man movies for that very reason, how long we've spent with the, the teenager, Peter Parker, who's learning the responsibilities uh, of being a Spider-Man, if you will, even though he's a boy. And so I felt comfortable and snookered. You know what I'm saying? Like I was lied to. Because I forgot. And that's my fault. That's how good the storytellers are. They made me forget what I know in the, every fiber of my being. Peter Parker never gets a happy ending. Spider-Man don't get a happy ending, man. Stan Lee, Steve Ditko created a put-upon character that even when he won, he usually fucking lost and stuff like that. So I forgot about that because I'm watching a movie and in movies, everybody wins. Except, you know, like fucking, except the rebels at the end of Empire. Um, But generally speaking, people always win in movies and stuff. Um, So, you know, movies about fictional stuff. Please don't be like, what about Schindler's List? Of course, like obviously not every movie people win and stuff. But in these movies about superheroes and shit like that, generally it ends on a fucking high note. Unless, you know, people get snapped out. There's more current reference. People are like, Empire Strikes Back, you're showing your fucking gray balls, old man. You're right. Snap is more current reference. Like, some movies do end, sadly. But generally speaking, everything ends up for heroes in a movie and shit. And that that is not the case, historically, for Peter Parker and Spider-Man. He's always fucking getting the shit end of the stick, even though he's the hero. And they fucking did it in the movie. They gave him the shit end of the stick. So hardcore. In the post credit sequence, which after 10 years of Marvel movies, 22 other Marvel movies, now everyone is trained to wait for. So the credits start rolling. Nobody in my packed theater got up because everybody's like, this ain't fucking done. But we all thought there'd be a little PS that's just like, oh, some fun little bits or something like that. No. Instead, what we get is Peter finishing his swing with MJ through the city. They land in front of Madison Square Garden. Madison Square Garden got that big screen up and stuff. And on the big screen is a news break where they show footage from uh, Mysterio right before he died. Quentin Beck. Spoilers, he dies in the end. We think. We're pretty damn sure he dies. Um, And, you know, there's this off-camera footage of, of, you know, Spider-Man's legs. And he's going like, Spider-Man, I was able to get the dimensional monster, knock him back into another dimension, but Spider-Man just attacked me like turns and sets up Spider-Man as the bad guy, which is something we all know from the fucking comic books. But when you think of like, who sets up fucking Spider-Man to be a bad guy in the comic books, there's one legendary fucking name, three letters uh, that everybody knows. He hates Spider-Man as J. Jonah Jameson, man. And so what do they do? Not only do they give us this Marvel Cinematic Universe version of J. Jonah Jameson, finally. Um, not only did they reinvent it for the time, so the Daily Bugle ain't some fucking newspaper, paper, it's the dailybugle.net, and J. Jonah Jameson is like an Alex Jones type of guy barking at the viewer about patriots and conspiracy theories, and he's talking about Mysterio died, a patriot of this world's greatest hero, you know, and who did him in but Spider-Man? He said, but that's not it. And they had this footage, you know, that Mysterio was shooting from their final showdown on the bridge. Completely misrepresents our hero. But then, just when you're like, oh, shit, man, I'm sitting there, this is brilliant. They just fucked up my boy's life and shit. Now spider man going to be the villain, like, throughout the city. He's right there in the middle of the city, and everyone's going to turn on him as Spider-Man. 
they took it one fucking step further, man. They dismantled my dreams of one more, you know, Spider-Man in high school movie because nothing will be the same after this. J. Jonah Jameson says like, you know, and then, you know, that's not all. Hold on to your hats and shit because this piece of information changes everything. And it's Quentin Beck saying Spider-Man is Peter Parker and he puts up a fucking picture of Peter Parker, spills his fucking identity. You have, you, of course you have every, I was gonna say, you have no idea. You have every idea. You probably saw the movie and you probably agree. What a brilliant fucking on-brand character point for Mysterio, that is. To be able to fuck with Spider-Man's life even from the fucking grave, like, oh my God. Um, to bring in a masterstroke that not only are they bringing J. Jonah Jameson in, but they brought the same J. Jonah Jameson that everybody agreed they loved from Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies, man. They brought in uh, J.K. fucking Simmons. I was going to say J.K. Rowling. That would have been fucking huge, right? If they're like, ladies and gentlemen, playing fucking J. Jonah Jameson, the creator of Harry Potter. Go figure. J.K. Rawlings and shit. And she's like, Spider-Man can't be trusted. Neither can Snape. Um, so fucking what a brilliant piece of fan service that is, man. As much as like we were all like, where's J. Jonah Jameson going to be in this mess? They bring him in and then they cast the guy who played him in the movies. We all like, like it's nostalgia already. Isn't that fucking nuts? Um, oh my God. Reinventing the Daily Bugle as the dailybugle.net and a conspiracy theorist website. Fucking brilliant. Like as a storyteller, like I was fucking delighted. That captured my imagination. That broke me of wanting to make a high school thing because I was like, suddenly I forgot about the fucking delightful high school movie I just watched. And the only movie I could think about was that two-minute movie in which they fucked Spider-Man's life up. Never mind the post-credit sequence with Talos, which was pretty fucking revealing in and of itself and shows this fucking Nick Fury up in space because I guess that's fuck the Earth. Now that's next. They, they, they fucking changed the entire Marvel Universe in a movie that, yeah, is a Marvel Studios movie, but is a fucking Sony movie, not a Disney movie. Pshoom, they pivoted. It's fucking nuts. In the background... You know, there's some construction at the end and you see like, wait till you see phase four, you know, because that's what's about to begin. They began phase four with such a bang. Kevin Feige, modern day fucking Harry Houdini. Let's just pray to Christ. He never gets punched in the ribs and drowns like the way Houdini died. He's such a fucking magician, man. I, I, you know, I, I got to give him credit because I, I think he's the one consistent, you know, uh, player throughout all these movies, whether it's a Disney or these Spider-Man movies at Sony, like... That is fantastic, man. Like, uh, fantastic. I mean, there was a moment in the movie where someone referenced Surfboard, and I was like, Surfboard? Fucking Silver Surfer? Fantastic Four? Oh my God, it's beginning! And they didn't. Nick Fury just had a surfboard. But um, Kevin Feige, like, oh! I just wanted to find him and fucking hug him, man. He honors the work of Stan Lee and Steve Ditko by fucking up Spider-Man's life. I wanted one more, you know, ha happily ever after high school movie before Peter goes on to like Empire State University and becomes grown up and has to deal with that shit. And they did what they did in the comics, what Stan and, and, and Steve always did. And all the other creators worked on Spider-Man. They fucked him up. They just said, yeah, it's not gonna be for our guy. He doesn't get to always win. He wins the battle, but he loses the war. So this is all just a preview for the recap. This is just me going, fuck that was spellbinding. Um, let's go back to the top of the movie, shall we? And recap the whole flick that I can remember uh, from the top. Mind you, I've I smoked a big old caviar joint, so I may not, details may fucking fly by. But let's try it, shall we? Okay. <laughs> Aha! You can see him talking, but he's not talking because he is no longer audible. Jay Mew's here, and I'm all about the audible business. Shooting out the spider webs. You don't want to listen to him. You want to listen to me because I have a deal for you, my friends. If you're an Amazon Prime member and you sign up for Audible, guess what? You will get the first three months at 66% off, which is about $30 off, which is like three months of a membership for the price of one. You see this guy, Jay Muse reading a book is like this. 
ooh, 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 squirrel. And then I come back and I'm like, where was I? Where I'm lost, but not with Audible, my friends. And then this deal is only from 7119 to 73119. And all you have to do is go to audible.com forward slash Kevin Smith. That's right. Or you could text Kevin Smith to 500, 500, man. There's so much I could tell you about Audible and what I like about it and what I love about it. I know you'll love it too, probably for the same exact reasons. And you and I will sit down one day and talk about it. Text Kevin Smith to or go to audible.com forward slash and let's not get back ever to this weird, weird thing going on with Kevin. Thanks, Muse. Anyway. Back to my review. Okay, not a review. Recap. Just to recap my position on reviews. Um, I I guess it's technically uh, technically a review. Uh, not a criticism. I, I can't, like, review things properly. Like, people are always telling me, oh, you just fucking suck Marvel's dick. That's a proper review, you know? But look, Siskel and Ebert had thumbs up and thumbs down. I have dick sucking. That's my fucking brand. You know what I'm saying? When I like something, I'm like two hands all over it with a big mouth. So just for those out there who are like, man, I just want to see him say something fucking negative about one of these movies. You won't. I love these movies. And you won't see me review anything negatively because there's no point. Like if I've already watched something and I don't like it, why am I going to waste my time telling you how much I didn't like it and shit? You know why? Because you might like it. Like you may see a completely different movie than me, so I'm not going to try to talk you out of it. But I will... Try to talk you into seeing shit I like. Now, you know, people are like, yeah, fucking Marvel really needs the help. It's not about fucking them. It's about me. I like chronicling these things just to capture the moment, man. I can't wait to watch these five years from now and be like, wow. I mean, look, number one, I'll be lucky if I'm alive five years from now. But to be able to look back and be like, look at all the passion I had before, you know, I went completely fucking gray or something like that is, is nice. My mom likes them too, by the way. But I won't. Negatively review things. Um, I just can't. It's not really in my DNA. Uh, I'll tell you, but you'll never, you'll never hear the end about shit I love. And I fucking loved Spider-Man Far From Home. Um, you have to realize how tough a tall order uh, they had with this flick. Not only are they following a really wonderful reboot of Spider-Man with the amazing Tom Holland, um, who is truly a gift to, to superhero cinema. Um, and to the character of Spider-Man in general. One of the only Spider-Men who ever spoke with a New York accent. Like, high props for that. Um, but we're following Endgame, which was like the be-all, end-all, and insanely satisfying. And, you know, fuck, we had Spider-Man in that movie, too. Just like we had him in Infinity War. So, you know, Tall Order capturing the magic again. You know, you're into sequel territory now. This is the second of the new Spider-Man. So... You know, what are you going to do? If you think about the Marvel sequels, some people didn't like Iron Man 2. Uh, some people, a lot of people didn't like Thor 2, The Dark World and stuff. So there's, you know, a history, uh, not a history, and again, it's not for everybody, but the same way some people are like, hey man, with those Star Trek movies, the even ones are good and the odd ones suck. You know, the, the second Marvel movie uh, sometime had a tough time getting out the gate for some. Not for me, I fucking, I, I loved Iron Man 2. And I loved, well, and I saw Thor 2 Dark World. But I loved Guardians of the Galaxy 2. I thought James Gunn was able to break that, was, uh, that streak or whatever the fuck, uh, that impression. Um, I thought that movie stood out and stuff. But some people will be like, it's not as book good as Guardians 1. Well, that's the magic of seeing Guardians for the first time. And then the second time, now you're just into the story of their world. Um, but I love that movie. This was going to be a, a tall hurdle clear because not only have there been another there's been another spider-man movie prior to this but we got helpings big helpings of spider-man in civil war this same spider-man uh and then in infinity war and in endgame war i just added that um and you know mind you we had about a decade of spider-man movies that were not tom holland prior to this as well as cartoons as well as amazing video games and stuff one could you know say like well perhaps there's some spider-man fatigue or something like that uh i wouldn't because just like batman this is a character that can you could fucking milk a thousand different ways we just spider-man just won an academy award into the spider-verse right so there was a chance that people were like all right man fucking enough with spider-man show us spider-woman or fucking like anyone else and 
they so they had a tall a tall fucking building to to clear man uh first smart thing they did was uh adding uh nick fury because suddenly you're like oh shit you're you're avengers adjacent and spider-man is an avenger as we saw in infinity war so hey tie these together because we didn't get a lot of nick fury in endgame so suddenly it's like oh Here's all the Nick Fury we, we missed in Endgame. They must have met at the funeral, and here we go. Um, that's smart. Smart taking it abroad. You know, it's like they're still high school kids, but they're on a high school trip. So it's not just like, oh, they're back at high school. Plus, after the events of Endgame with kids blipping out and whatnot, you know, they, they had to do something different. And boy, did they. Um, so, you know, that was bright, but the most brilliant fucking thing they did was use Mysterio as a character. I love this character. I've, I've been a Mysterio fan for my whole life. Ever since I saw him in the cartoon, probably. The very first place I saw him was in the old Spider-Man, Spider-Man cartoon. Um, my God, look how, look at the beauty of this design. This is from uh, the old Marvel dolls they used to do, man, uh, the Toy Biz. Uh, they used to sell it at KB. KB used to be a toy store. A toy store used to be a place you bought toys before Amazon. So I've had this for a long, long time, man. I love the character in Mysterio. I put him in my Daredevil run um, with Joe Quesada years ago because I love that character so much. And was I felt he was always like underutilized. No, he's like kind of a joke. Um, they not only included Mysterio, who lends himself to cinematic treatment because, you know, he's the master, the mister of the, ma- no, that's Dr. Strange's master of the mystic arts because he could do fucking illusions and stuff like that. His whole shtick is fucking tricking Spider-Man and everybody. You know, no real power. He's a special effects guy from the movies and shit. So including that character in the movies was brilliant. That character's made for the fucking movies, man. But the master stroke, the fucking hat upon the hat, the cherry. I don't like cherries. The fucking whipped cream. That's good enough. Why do people have to fucking make it better with a cherry? Like that makes it better? Something natural? Uh, The whipped cream on the top of the ice cream is Jake... My God, he looks fuckable Gyllenhaal. I'm not sure that's his real name. I think I looked in the credits, but that's what I put in there. Oh my God, he's fantastic, man. Uh, Playing Quentin Beck, and he plays the shit out of Quentin Beck. You believe him when he's, you know, fucking buddying up to Peter, and you believe it when maybe that ain't the case. Let's go through it. So you got these elements of play. They open the movie with a scene with uh, Maria Hill and and um, and Nick Fury going to this town in, in a, some other country that's not America. You could tell I'm American, but I'm like, it's someplace not here. I forget which place it's said. Maybe Mexico, maybe, 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 it, it, I think it was a, I think, it, I think it was a Latin country, if I remember that correctly. Something going on. There's a hurricane, a hurricane, a storm had a face. And then suddenly they see this like storm rise up and it does have a face. And then poof, this like green smoke hits the ground and poof, they give you Mysterio in the first three minutes, man. There he is in all of his fucking helmeted glory. They didn't shy away from this fucking shit. Any other era they make this movie, ain't got no glass fucking bubble, man. Are you kidding me? They didn't fucking put the suits on the X-Men when they made that movie the first time. They put them in black leather and they made fun of their fucking suits from the comics. So there was no chance you were ever going to get a bubble-headed Mysterio until this day and age, the Marvel age of movies, where people demand that their characters look like their characters, look like the characters they've known from the books forever. So boom, fucking within the first three minutes, bowl, fishbowl Mysterio on a big screen. I, you know, I had, a, as I previously mentioned, a little boy next to me. If he wasn't there, poof, I would have just burst nuts in my pants. Are you kidding me? And I knew he was going to be in it. I saw it in the trailer. But in the first three minutes, they give me Mysterio and then the bowl disappears. The way that like Tony's face mask disappears. The way all their masks disappear now in the Marvel Universe. Nobody takes their helmet off anymore. It's just like, and it goes away and shit. It disappears and then you see Jake Gyllenhaal and all his fucking bearded fucking otter glory. That's all I could say, man. He's no, He's an otter for sure. Um, so... He's like, you know, who are you? You don't want any part of this. And dramatically fucking like does Mysterio hands and shit. And then we cut to uh, the credit sequence, the Marvel card up top of the movie. We're hearing Whitney Houston uh, singing uh, 
um, I Will Always Love You. This is one of the most expensive songs you could put in a fucking movie. Number one, Dolly Parton wrote it. Number two, Whitney Houston recorded it. Number three, it was in a hit movie called The Bodyguard. Number four, it chart it topped the charts for a long, long fucking time, man. So like in a world of uh, of securing songs for movies, shit. Like, all right, here, I'll give you a case in point. Made a movie called Tusk uh, about a guy who turns another guy into a walrus. Uh, which is why I never get the call from Marvel going, come work for us. But in any event, many, that many reasons. But in that movie, Tusk, I wanted to use the song Tusk because I'm, I'm that simple and on the nose and shit. And Fleetwood Mac, I listened to Tusk the whole time I was writing Tusk. So I was like, I, this song's got to play in the third act and shit. And we got it. And that song cost $250,000 to put into the movie. We didn't even use the whole song. Put it in the movie, 250, a quarter of a million dollars. That song cost more than the walrus suits that Justin Long wore in Tusk. It was the single most expensive element of the movie. So that's how much music that you know can cost. Like when Thor Ragnarok used the immigrant song, ah, that was like previously one of the most expensive fucking songs ever put in a movie. So when they opened this song with that Whitney Houston song, I was like, shit, man. We're going to see a bunch of money get spent. This is one giant ATM, man. Right right off the bat. We just saw Mysterio. We just saw fucking Storm with the face on it and shit like that. They're just fucking spending the money. Oh, it's just fucking raining. Fucking make it rain. Dollar bills, man, as they try to get ours from us, man. That's the big swindle here, right? We'll spend a bunch of money in hopes of getting your money. And they got my fucking money. Twice, son. So... Uh, the music is playing over a montage. Uh, kid made a video uh, that's like a homage, if you will, to the fallen heroes, uh, who is Black, uh, Black Widow, uh, Vision, um, and someone else. But then, of course, Tony Stark is the last one. I think there was another Avenger. Who, who is it? Cap. Thank you, Josh. Reminded me. Cap. And then, of course, Tony Stark. Uh, and all the images are pulled offline and shit like that. The image of Tony Stark is from when he was on the cover of like Time or Newsweek when they were, you know, in, in Iron Man, the very first Iron Man. Shit like that. There's a lot of fan service, a lot of pulling from other movies to put into this movie in the way that like the creators of comic books for years drew from other stories and referenced them and stuff like that. So perfect. So um, you see the two kids... Uh, Betty and the other guy who did the news in the last movie, last Spider-Man like uh, uh, Homecoming, like the in-school news video, and they catch us up to speed on these fallen heroes who gave their life. Uh, they don't call it the snap in the movie; they call it the blip. Uh, we call it the snap because we saw the movie and we saw Thanos snap. They didn't; they just felt the effects and then fucking felt the aftermath, and then everybody came back. They call it the blip. People blipped out, and like just like. When, you know, uh, Endgame came out and people online were like, what happened if you fucking snapped back and you were in a plane flying in the air like and the plane wasn't there? Would you just fall to the ground and shit? They had a bunch of people. They showed you what happens when people uh, snapped back. Like the a bunch of kids, like fucking bunch of basketball players disappeared during a game. Then at the same gym, they were doing like a band presentation and the basketball players blipped back in and fucking ran into them or vice versa. So it was funny, but they set up the notion of like, yeah, it was fucked up when people came back. They also set up the notion that some kids blipped away and then came back and they were still the same age, but the kids that stayed behind aged in their place. So one kid went from being like a little nerdy kid to being totally fuckable and, and hot and studly and shit in the five-year absence, and that comes into play because that dude really likes Mary Jane. And Peter knows this. So Peter and Mary Jane, which wasn't really, MJ, can't say Mary Jane, wasn't really a thing in the last one because Peter, you know, really liked the vulture's daughter, um, Liz. So this time around, though, they kind of, you know, get right to it, man. And then you realize at the end of the movie, like, oh, shit. No wonder they let them, have, you know, jump, jump into romance because they're ripping it away in the next movie. Um, so they start noticing each other, liking each other, being interested in each other, looking at each other, furtive eyes, flirting, and shit like that, more so than they had in the last movie at all. So, and that's not a complaint. You know, I, it, it's, it, we talked about it at, at the show, at the cantina. 
you know, people are like, that's fucking high school, bitch. Like, fucking, you know, because somebody was like, maybe that was a little fast. But everyone else was like, that's fucking high school, man. Like, teenage romance moves in stupid ways and shit. So, uh, these, uh, we're in a post-blip world. Peter really likes MJ. He's making plans for the school trip they're going on. He's telling Ned what he wants to do, um, how he's going to, like, get her up to the top of the Eiffel Tower and give her this Black Dahlia necklace because she likes the Black Dahlia because of the murders. Um, she, you know, they paid MJ as, like, quasi-goth, kind of emo and stuff, or just, like, a little left of center. Um, so, uh, you know, Ned's like, don't do any of that, man. We're going to go to fucking Europe. We're going to be bachelors, man. Number one, if there's one thing I know, Americans, he goes, Europeans love Americans, which is very funny. Uh, he says, number two, um, like, we'll be bachelors over there, man. Like, you know, don't don't be getting involved with MJ, but Peter wants to and stuff. Uh, meanwhile, Peter is uh, working with Aunt May. Uh, she They're having benefits for people who are victims of the blip, people who are displaced. She tells a story about how she blipped back after five years, so she also was snapped away. She, in the snapping, her and Peter, and everyone Peter cares about, luckily, so we can tell our story. And, um, you know, she said, when I came back, when I blipped back, you know, I was in somebody else's apartment. My apartment was somebody else's, and, and the lady thought I was having an affair with her husband. So they're having this benefit, and then she brings out, like, you know, Spider-Man, your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, is wearing the, the Iron Spider armor, you know, still from Endgame and stuff. And uh, talks to the crowd, they raise some loot, then he goes backstage, and, you know, the, we remember from the end of the last movie, the Aunt May saw Peter with his mask off, and she goes, what the fuck? And just like at the end of this movie, Peter goes, what the fuck? And then we go right to credits when, when his thing happens with J. Jonah Jameson. So, you know, clear, clearly she's cool with him being Spider-Man and stuff. Happy Hogan shows up with a big check from, from Stark Industries, from Pepper Potts. Um, you know, and it, you get the feeling like him and May know each other a little bit better, you know, as Peter's getting a bit of a Peter tingle about it, if you will. Um, that's the notion that's introduced later on. Aunt May introduces <coughs> the notion of the spider sense, which we didn't see in Spider-Man Homecoming, but we did see represented visually with the hair standing up in, in, in Avengers Infinity War. But in the Spider-Man movies, these Spider-Man movies, Tom Holland's Spider-Man movies, the John Watts Spider-Man movies, because this motherfucker's a towering talent, um, they haven't done spider sense yet. But they finally did in this movie, and, they, and Aunt, Aunt May calls it Peter Tingle. She's like, are you getting your Peter Tingle? He's like, don't call it that. So that becomes a running joke uh, throughout the movie. And really funny. I mean, you get, they get away with dick jokes in these Spider-Man movies now. Like a Peter Tingle, at one point he's got a new suit on. He's like, he's a little tight in the wool web shooter, around the old web shooter. And you're like, oh, fuck. They just made a cum joke in a fucking Disney movie. I love the world we live in today. So Peter getting ready for this class trip. Um... He don't want to bring the suit with him, uh, you know, because he just wants to chill and relax. He don't want to bring the fucking, you know, nanotech suit either, which they show you in its container. Looks like a little fucking Red Bull fridge, and it's just like floating and fucking doing science techie things. And he doesn't bring his old, like, suit suit either. He just wants to go and packs his bag, and they get on the plane, man, and, and they skip all the shit you saw in the trailer about him picking up his passport and shit. And uh, on a plane, he's got the two teachers with him, J.B. Smooth and Martin Starr, who were also in uh, Homecoming. And he wants to sit, Peter wants to sit next to MJ, but he's sitting next to Ned, and Ned wants to play Beast Wars or some such shit, and he wants to play a video game, but Peter's got this plan. i got a dual headset jack so we can watch movies the whole way and stuff. And so, you know, Ned tells says, hey, Peter needs to switch with, with uh, Betty, who's sitting next to MJ because he's allergic to perfume. And, and then suddenly Martin Starr's like, you're allergic to perfume? That ain't no joke. You gotta sit up here, Peter. And so he winds up sitting next to Martin Starr. And the guy who, you know, aged well over five years and become the hunky guy, he gets to sit next to MJ and they're watching a movie together and with the dual headphone jack. And who knew that was still a thing? So um, they get to... Uh, Europe, and I think it's Venice first. Yeah, it's Venice. Uh, Italy, because uh, it's all water and shit like that. And uh, the kids are on the boat. I forgot to mention Happy Hogan when he brought the check to Spider-Man was like Nick Fury's calling you. And Spider-Man's like, I don't want to talk to Nick Fury. And he's like, you don't ghost Nick Fury. You saw that shit in the trailer. 
So they set up the Nick Fury's looking for him. And Spider, Spider-Man, Spider Peter Parker, don't really want to answer it and stuff. He goes on the trip. Um, they're in Venice. Um, let me see. Does this happen before or after? Yeah, the water thing, and then he Nick's, and then Nick Fury happens. So they're in Venice, and they're touring the city, and you know it's the, water, the city that's on the canals, and water everywhere. Um, suddenly, pff, fucking water explodes and shit, and turns into a giant creature that's attacking everybody. And you know Peter's like telling Ned, get everybody out of here and stuff. He has no mask. It's a big deal. He's like, I don't have a mask. He's like, but nobody's going to look at my face. He goes and gets like a carnival looking mask to put on and shit. Hiding his identity is a thing with him. Because he doesn't want people to see Spider-Man in Europe. Because then people will be like, if Peter Parker's in Europe and Spider-Man's in Europe, Peter Parker and Spider-Man are the same person. You know, they don't want anyone to figure it out and shit. They play with the identity thing a bunch. It's very subtle. But they need to for that fucking third act and shit where they rip his fucking identity away from him and shit. Um... So Peter tries to fight the water monster, but it's fucking way big. And then out of nowhere, fucking bam, Mysterio shows up and he fights the fucking water monster. And Spider-Man's like, you know, Peter dressed in the mask, being Peter more than Spider-Man, is like, I can help, I'm sticky. And he's like, lead him away from the canals, Mysterio. And so uh, bam, they fight him and Mysterio like takes the water monster out and fucking everyone's applauding and shit, saves everybody. He does one of these and fucking takes off. And you're like, oh shit, he's a good guy. But those of us who know comics are like, yeah, he's a fucking good guy. So, you know, Peter's like, suddenly we saw Peter not be, not not that he wasn't heroic, but he couldn't really do much against something like that. Which is weird because he fucking fought Thanos. Punched him in the face and shit. Got punched by Thanos. But, you know, Peter may be feeling a little gun shy in the absence of Tony Stark, his mentor. So, you know, he goes back to the a, a room at night, and that's where Ned gets tranked in the neck. Ned and Betty, they started dating on the plane. So, you know, even though Ned was like, let's be bachelors in Europe, he fucked it all up because he's in a relationship and stuff. They call each other babe. It's really fun. So he gets tranked. Ned, he goes down. That's when we reveal Nick Fury, and he says, come with me to Spider-Man. And he brings Spider-Man uh, to down into the guts of the city to meet Quentin Beck, who is a hero from another Earth, a different Earth than ours. And, uh, you know, that after the snap or whatever, other dimensions were opened up, and he came here from a dimension that's not our dimension, like setting up a multiverse, as we saw in the trailer. But I knew it was bullshit, even in the trailer. I was like, they ain't doing it. They ain't doing a multiverse. They're going to leave that for DC. Marvel's got the entire galaxy. They've got the universe. They're like, we're not, we're not going to tell stories about other versions of our characters. We're going to show you all the other fucking characters that exist rather than being like, oh, here's dark Spider-Man and shit. They're going to be like, here's the Eternals, motherfucker. We got a deep bench. So they trick him. I mean, he's throwing it out there. He's, I'm, 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 you know, my world was destroyed by these elementals. Fire, air, you know, earth, water, whatever the fuck. And uh, so, uh, uh, you know, fire destroyed my world. He was the most deadly and he killed my family and shit. All super heroic shit that you're like, I buy this, which is the point. And so uh, Nick Fury's like, you're going to team up with with fucking this guy. Um, And uh, he said, because like, you know, fucking Stark believed in you. He trusted in you and fucking left you these glasses. Is it happy giving the glasses or fucking, or was it? No, it was... Nick Fury gives him these glasses inside. Uh, there's a little note and it says to the next, for the next Iron Man or something like that from TS. Um, so, you know, Peter's got these glasses but doesn't really know like what to do with them. It's just bequeathed to him more or less. Uh, but Nick Fury, you know, he's like, I can't fight these monsters. And that's the moment from the trailer where Nick Fury's like, bitch, you please, you've been to space. So he's going to team up with uh, Mysterio. They know this uh, monster's heading toward Prague. At first, Peter don't want to go. He wants to go on his trip. So he tells, you know, Nick Fury, I I don't want to do this and shit. And he's like, oh, okay, fuck off. So he goes back, but then his teachers are like, hey, man, the tour group, like, updated us. We're going to Prague. And that's when he's like, I think Nick Fury just hijacked our summer vacation. So in Prague, he's set up, you know, to fucking watch from the, the, the fire monster that's coming. Um, and there's a big carnival going on and shit. And 
his friends, he makes sure they get put to safety, go into an opera with the teachers and whatnot. And Peter goes with them, and he's going to hang out with MJ, and you can tell they're getting tighter. But then he's got to go off on his fucking mission instead, help Nick Fury and Mysterio. And so they have that moment where, like, Peter, same thing they did in, in uh, Homecoming, where Peter's at the party, and then he goes to leave, and he looks back, and he looks at the life he doesn't get to enjoy because he has responsibility with great power comes great responsibility. It's this tiny fucking moment, but it really makes everything because you just see this is a boy. That's what's beautiful about the Spider-Man story. He's a boy. He's a boy who would just like to do boyish things, kid things. He's a kid. Like he just wants to, he doesn't want to go to the opera, but he just wants to sit next to MJ and fucking get a relationship going and stuff like that. But instead, responsibility. So off he goes. Meanwhile, MJ is kind of clocking him. So she tries to follow him. And then Betty and Ned are like, fuck it, they're leaving. Look, I bet you they're going to Carnival. Let's go. So they head out and shit like that. So now the stage is set for the next big set piece. And, you know, mind you, like uh, Peter and Nick Fury have the, uh, P- Peter and Mysterio have a conversation, you know, they, where P- Mysterio is like, Nick Fury, why don't you come up here and apologize? He said he felt bad. And Spider Man's like, really? And he's like, you, you do have sarcasm on this earth, don't you? So he sits and has a, a man to boy chat. It sounds fucking dirty, but it has like an adult to minor. That sounds dirty too. All of this sounds fucking like pedo talk. He has a conversation with Peter and it's very reminiscent of a mentor having a conversation with a mentee or a mint, whatever the fuck. Um, the way Tony Stark used to talk to, to Peter, you know, and so suddenly you're looking at a bearded guy who's being real nice to the kid and giving him a life advice that's more about like the hero game is blah, blah, blah. You know, what do you want, Peter? And he's like, I want to, I want to, you know, be with the girl and stuff. I want to, and he's like, go, go be with the girl. And that's that happened before Nick Fury fucking took over their vacation. So now the stage is set. Peter and Mysterio working together and stuff. And like at one point, you hear them like he's like, I'm in the tower. Peter says, I'll let you know when I see anything. And Mysterio goes, On your lead, Spider Man. Like, oh, and I fucking love that. I love that so much. Mysterio and Spider Man working together for a minute. And Spider-Man believing that that was the fucking case and having the benefit of knowing that's never going to be the fucking case because it's Mysterio and shit. Oh, it was fantastic. So the Lava Monster, Fire Monster shows up. Uh, They fight it. Mysterio's fighting it and shit. Spider-Man fighting it. The monster turns his attention on Ferris Wheel and Ned and and Betty. So Peter's got to save them. But he's wearing a black suit. He got this black suit. I probably left off a lot of shit. I did. Before this happens, there's this whole on the road to Prague thing. So let me step back. So they give him a new black suit because he didn't bring, you know, he brought a suit, Aunt May packed his suit for him, which we saw in a little funny bit when he first got there. Um, but they want to get him a stealth suit because Peter's like, they can't see Spider-Man in Europe because Peter Parker's in Europe and if they see that, they're going to know that I'm Spider-Man. Once again, establishing how an identity and secret identity is really important to Peter. So they have S.H.I.E.L.D. or whatever organization Nick Fury's in charge of now because S.H.I.E.L.D. is gone makes up a new black suit. That's the suit you see Spider-Man wearing in the trailer, so flip up eyes. And, you know, meets Peter at one point on the road when the bus is taking all the kids to Prague. Um, uh, The bus that was arranged by Nick Fury. And the driver of it is one of his, like, mercenary dudes. So Peter, you know, is called into the side room by this lady, and she's like, this is a suit I made for you. Put it on. And you never seen her before. Um, it's not like, you know, it, it would have been, it seemed like a place you could have put pepper pots, but I guess for what they're about to do, it'd be weird. So she's like, take off your clothes, put this on, take off your clothes. And Peter's getting undressed, takes his pants off. And then that dude who grew up, I forget his name, Brad, I don't know. Um, you know, who likes MJ, just like Peter, sees Peter with his pants down with this lady. And he's like, whoa. And he takes a picture and he's like, I'm telling MJ, bro, and shit. And Peter's like, what the? And the lady just like goes to shoot him. And Peter stops him and stuff. So Peter's nervous because now this guy's got a picture that he says he's going to share with MJ of Peter and in, in flagrante delecto with this lady and shit. He's going to have a lot of explaining to do. So Peter puts on these glasses that Tony gave him when they're on the bus, right? And um, the glasses come to life and talk to him like, hello, Peter. And they scan him and shit like that. Um, Tony has left in Peter's care his AI tech called Edith. And this is one of the funniest moments in the entire movie. When Edith finally says what her name Edith is an acronym, Edith goes, Edith stands for Even Dead, I'm the Hero. 
So Tony Stark built this before he died and fucking named it that, knowing he was probably going to fucking die. And how fucking in character is that? Tony Stark, there's some flashback footage of him in this movie, but there's no current Robert Downey Jr. in the movie. But you might as, he might as well be in the fucking flick. He's felt everywhere. And that is the most Tony Starkiest moment in the entire fucking movie. Even dead, I'm the hero. He's so fucking wonderfully arrogant. So these glasses allow Peter to see tech, interrupt tech, see people what they're texting each other and stuff. And he sees that, that this kid's about to text MJ the picture of him and stuff. So he's like, I got to stop Brad. And, you know, Edith, as we learn, is a high-tech fucking defense and offense system and satellite up in space. So Peter's like, you know, stop him. And so it launches a fucking drone from space that's going to, and this is the first drone we see of many, um, that's going to zone in on and kill this fucking kid on the bus. And Peter, there's a bit of comedy with the glasses on and Peter talking and people talking to Peter and him answering them and not to the Edith system, but Edith system mistakes it for her and for, for Peter talking to her. And so she's launching fucking drones and going to kill people and Peter's got to save the fucking bus and shit like that. Um, but they set up through that wacky little action sequence that Peter is in charge of multi-billion dollar tech and he nearly almost killed somebody with it. So that's when Nick Fury's like, you were in, you know, fucking, he put you in charge of all this tech, you almost killed somebody with it, giving Peter the fucking guilties. That's when Peter has the conversation later on with Mysterio and stuff. So, you know, Peter, uh, and like I said, now we're jumping back to the attack. The fire monster has attacked Prague and fucking Peter and, well, Night Monkey, as they're calling him, because Ned is in the Ferris wheel with with uh, with um, Betty, and she's like, is that Spider-Man? And Ned, you know, he's still Peter's man in the chair. He's trying to keep a secret and shit. And he's like, no, man, I ain't Spider-Man. That's a rip-off, knock-off, cheap European version they got over here. And she's like, what's he called? And he's like, Night Monkey. And so she's like, Night Monkey! Night Monkey, save us! And Peter looks up and I'm like, what? And he notices his friends are in there while the fire monster is trying to attack. And so at one point, Peter launches his web like to try to get to the Ferris wheel and shit, but it hits like a force field and comes down and he's like, what? But shit's going on so fast, it's confusing. That piece of tech falls to the ground and fucking MJ, who's been watching some of this shit, grabs it and fucking Spirit's got webbing all over it. She's trying to figure out a mystery of her own. So uh, Mysterio, you know, is like, you got to keep him away from the power. If he gets power, he'll get bigger. He gets bigger. The thing gets bigger. Mysterio's like, I'm not going to let what happened in my home world happen here. He's like, I'm, I'm going to, and Peter's like, what are you going to do? Spider-Man or Night Monkey. He's like, what are you going to do? And he's like, what I should have done last time. And he fucking like, ah, does a Tony Stark like charge into the heart of the beast and then fucking blows him up from inside. And they find Mysterio, Quentin Beck laying on the ground and, Spider-Man runs over to be like, oh my God, he's been busy trying to save Ned and Betty from a falling fucking uh, Ferris wheel. So he finds Quentin back, he's still alive, and he's like, did we get him? He's like, yeah, we got him and shit. And so they save the fucking day, and then Quentin Beck's like, you know, let's go out and get a drink. So they're at a bar in Prague, and, you know, he's talking about uh, Quentin and, and Spider-Man are talking about, Mysterio and Spider-Man are talking about what just went on and what Peter really wants. And he's like, what do you want, Peter? And he's like, I just want to like be a kid. I just want to go kiss a girl, kiss MJ, and blah, blah, blah. And, and you know, he's, he's like, uh, at one point, somebody's like, you dropped these, the glasses. And um, he's like, they were just on the floor? And he's like, yeah. He's like, you know, the glasses. He's like, here, he's like, put them on. Let me see. Peter puts them on. And he's like, uh, you know, Mysterio goes, they look really stupid. And uh, he goes, you put them on. And so Mysterio puts on the glasses. And for one second, you get the impression of Tony Stark. It's so fucking sinister. It like, even us for the audience. Like, you know, look, piano cue, the right music, you can sell anything. And they put this fucking cue under it where you're like, that's Tony Stark right there, man. That's his mentor and shit. So Peter's like, you know what? These glasses are supposed to be for the next Iron Man. And he's like, that ain't me. He's like, Mr. Stark knew that I was a fuck-up. And he knew all my fucking fuck-ups. So he knew he would never be able to trust me with Edith. But, like, he want, I think he wanted me to pick somebody, his successor. So I'm, I'm giving the glasses to you. And he, Mysterio's like, are you sure? And he's like, yeah, man. You're, like, you're, coming, you're on this world now. He's going to be going to Berlin with fucking... 
uh, with Nick Fury, you know, to present him to the fucking World Council or whatever, and be like, here's a new hero, almost making him an Avenger and shit. And so, you know, Peter's like, yeah, man, he, this is the right, I know in my heart of hearts this is the right thing to do. So he tells Edith, he's like, you know, I'm out of this, now it's going to give it to Quentin Beck. And he takes the glasses and shit, and, and he's like, I'm out of here, and he goes to find MJ, and Mysterio and him shake hands, and off he goes. As he exits the building, goes around the corner, you know, we're seeing him go through the windows, the room starts fucking digitizing and shit. And you realize that this motherfucker has been stung. They just pulled the sting on him and shit. This was a sting worthy of fucking Newman and Redford, man. And Redford's been in these fucking movies, man. So everybody's disappearing except the key players, man. Like uh, real people. Everyone else just holograms. Everything else, the life in the bar, total holograms. They come back to Quentin Beck and he's still wearing the glasses and... Fucking, they're all quiet and shit. Once Peter's completely gone out of view, he's like, that wasn't so hard, was it? And everybody's like, woo! And they celebrate, and you realize as they give you exposition, they spoon feed you villain exposition, but they do it in such a great way. Uh, you realize that Mysterio is not a man, but a team. Team Mysterio. And a lot of them are made up of, if not all of them, disgruntled Stark industry employees. This is a stroke of brilliance. For some reason, I remember... Like, the, I, forget, I think it was when I talked to Marcus and McFeely, like here, when we review, when we were talking about Endgame with them, me and Mark, um, they said something about like, everything comes back and gets referenced. And they said like, remember the barf technology? That's gonna play a role. Like, even that wasn't just something, like the barf technology was at the beginning of Civil War. First movie we introduced uh, Spider-Man into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, Tony is is kind of seeing his parents and a young version of him reliving a memory and then you know it starts disappearing in the same way that the room started disappearing in in uh, the bar that we just saw disappear the wireframe and shit like a special effect design stripped bare that same fucking system that Tony was like you know I spent 250 million dollars for this called barf had a bad name and shit Tony didn't strictly invent that himself we reveal as Quentin Beck starts fucking doing the villain speech, a celebratory villain speech, because they're all celebrating, they're like, speech and shit. So he starts talking about what they've all just accomplished in order to get the glasses back. Whole thing has been a fucking scam. The whole Mysterio thing. Um, he said at one point, when we first met Peter, when you know he introduced the notion of the multiverse, Peter was just like confounded by this, and then you know uh, he says a bunch of scientific things, and... and uh, Nick Fury looks at him and like, what? And Mysterio's like, never apologize. You know, Peter's like, I'm sorry. And he's like, never apologize for being the smartest guy in the room, Peter. Like, right away, setting the tone for the mentor relationship. Um, and he says something about being a smart guy as well. He's like, they're the smartest people in the fucking room, but nobody will listen to them anymore. Nobody listens to anybody unless you've got a cape and you can shoot lasers from your hands. And he's like, well, I got a cape, and now I can shoot lasers from my hands. So this guy invented the barf technology. They show you that Civil War scene where Tony Stark's like, I call it barf, and they cut to an angle where suddenly Jake Gyllenhaal is backstage watching this thing, and he's like, my life's work is called barf? Like, he was fucked over by Tony Stark. Then they also show William, who is a character who is an Iron Man. Um, the guy that, that uh, Jeff Bridges yelled at when he was like, Tony Stark built this in a cave, you know, and all that shit. And he's like, I'm not Tony Stark. That's William. That's played uh, by Peter Billingsley. Peter Bing Billingsley, you remember from A Christmas Story. You know, he's Ralphie and shit. So he was in Iron Man. He's friends with Favreau and shit. Um, this is, I think, one of the first times he's been back, man. They brought him back as a character that was also ousted, you know, and like fucking all these people. One of them's named Victoria. That's one of the producers on the movies, Victoria Alonzo. It was real cute. They had a screenwriter in their group. Um, all these people have been burned by fucking Tony Stark, by the, you know, fucking drunken man child and shit like that, the party boy. And, you know, now that, that he's gone, they, they, he was going to leave this multi billion dollar fucking defense system that they all helped build in the hands of a fucking teenager. So they were like, you know, fuck it. You know, this is what we had to do, and now we got it. And now Mysterio will be the greatest hero of all time, and people will finally fucking listen to us and shit because we speak from this guy and blah, blah, blah. So the whole thing 
is fucking Looney Tunes, man. It's a big scam. It's a big lie. It's exactly fucking Mysterio in the comics. Like, he never did this story in the comics. This is hands down the best incarnation of this character. But it is so true to everything that character fucking stands for, man. Spellbinding. So suddenly, like, we, we know what's up. Peter don't know what's up. Peter tries to go back to his life. And meanwhile, at the hotel, they're like, all our parents want us home, man. There are monsters here. J.B. Spoof has, like, killer two, two killer lines where at one point, you know, he's talking about all this shit going on. And he's like, he's, somebody says, what do you think it is? He's like, as a man of science, witches. <laughs> and at one point later on, he's like, we got to leave Europe because wi- we came for science. We're leaving because of witches. And so Peter sees MJ, MJ sees Peter, and they play a little flirty flirty in the hallway. And then she's, and he goes to knock on her door and she opens it. And hey, you want to go out? You want to go for a walk? And yeah. And so they have a quiet time to go ha- walk and have a conversation. And so, you know, Peter's getting ready to tell MJ that, you know, he likes her. So he's like, I am. And she's like, Spider-Man, I know. He's like, what? I'm not Spider-Man. And she starts piecing it together going like, you're never there. You know, in Washington, you disappeared and stuff. She's like, look, the one girl in our class thinks you're a male prostitute. And he's like, I'm not a male prostitute. She's like, then you're Spider-Man. And so she's got, she's like, look, Spider-Man, you know, he's like, there's a guy here that saved people. He's like, that's Night Monkey. I read about that guy's the Night Monkey. And she pulls out that piece of tech that she picked up, got web all over. She's like, Night Monkey use the same webbing Spider-Man uses? And then it drops and fucking all of a sudden it turns on and projects like that fucking cloud monster, this giant monster and shit. And they're like, what the fuck is that? And it disappears and like, that's like a hologram or something like that. And they click it again and fucking it comes back up and it's just moving across them and shit. But at the same time, all of a sudden, Peter's like, who would do that? And Mysterio comes into view in the hologram and he's like, oh no. He's like, I just, he realizes what he did, what he did was wrong and shit like that. So he tells MJ, he goes, um, I am Spider-Man. And she's like, what? She's like, you're not fucking with me, are you? She's like, you know, because I was, I, when I asked, I was 63% sure or something like that, 67% sure. And he's like, I am, but I got I did something really bad and I got to fix it and shit like that. So, you know, you get out of here and blah, blah, blah. I got to go do this. Off he goes to try to find Nick Fury, if I remember correctly. Um, or Nick Fury finds him and then brings him into this office and, you know, he starts laying it all on the line. Because meanwhile... Uh, they showed, you know, Quentin Beck and his team Mysterio building the next illusion. Like, you know, and, and it's the illusions are all made of drones, these giant fucking drones that, you know, cast holographic images to hide what they are. But inside, they're drones with weapons, so these holograms could do real damage. That's what William brought to the project, uh, Quentin Beck told us when he was like, and William, you know, you're weaponized drones and shit. So suddenly they can make an illusion that impacts. So it can destroy a canal. It can knock a tower over and something like that because it's all these drones doing it inside the illusion. So, you know, Peter is like, I, I, you know, I realize that I just gave, it, gave him the glasses and shit like that, and blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, like, the room, you know, he goes, wait, the spider gets, he gets a Peter tingle. And he goes, Beck is here. Mysterio is here and the room starts disappearing and shit and you wireframe and you and Nick Fury is still there um, and you realize that he's like fucking like he's real but everything else is an illusion and that's when they fucking kick open the doors of the Mysterio mind fuck sequence which is fantastic it's beautiful it's everything uh, that you want to see Mysterio fucking do, including like take you know have it take off his head and shake it like a fucking snow globe because Peter's trapped inside of it with snow in a city. Um, he multiplies himself. It's Pete. It's Mysterio fucking with Peter, getting in his head with all these illusions and creating a world around him. Like when they did this in the comics, uh, artists you know had imagination to go wild and draw things trippy to show Spider-Man freaking out and stuff as his mind is attacked. This, this is done in a movie. Like, you know, remember in, um, and this ain't like raising, lowering one to raise another, but remember in Batman Begins, like whenever Scarecrow like fucking worked his dust magic and shit and people inhale it and they see shit and they'd be like, ah! This is that dialed up to 11 times fucking 10. It's just a fantastic sequence. I keep saying fantastic, but it's a marvelous sequence in which, uh, Mysterio gets inside the head of Spider-Man and you don't know what's real and Spider-Man's fucked with and shit and he fucks with him to the point where 
Like, uh, Nick Fury gets shot, but then all of a sudden it's not Nick Fury, and Spider-Man is outside, then he's fucking inside, um, and Mysterio is telling him all these things. Peter, you can't do this, you're blah, 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 just, just doing what you do in the comics. And eventually pushes Peter out, like, you know, into uh, the tra- a path of a moving train. You know, suddenly the illusion stops, and you see uh, Quentin Beck there, and he doesn't have Mysterio gear on and shit, he's wearing a mocap suit motion capture suit like they do to make these fucking movies and an ironic bit of commentary and reality pops back in and boom fucking spider-man gets hit by a train and disappears so quentin beck is a fucking killer like not only are they like we want revenge on tony stark and we want the edith technology they're willing to kill people in fact like now that they've got the edith technology they're going into london because they've got to tie up loose ends kill anybody that knew peter and shit that might know peter's secret um, and also put on an Avengers level fucking threat that will prove Mysterio is the greatest hero of all time and ensconce them fucking. And you know, the, he wants to, Quentin Beck wants to dial up the weapons on the drones like into heavy damage. And like, that's going to kill a lot of people and it's going to cause a lot of casualties. And he goes, hey man, it's London. They'll rebuild. But like, you know, we got to do this. And so these things are going to fucking kill. And he knows he wants to kill. Nick Fury and Maria Hill and all Peter's friends. He thinks Peter is dead now. But fucking Peter ain't dead. Climbs up onto the top of the fucking train from the bottom of it and shit and gets inside the train car and goes, passes out and wakes up in jail in the Netherlands and shit with a bunch of nice dudes in the jail. And then uh, he goes out and he busts the lock and leaves and he walks past the, the guy, you know, the chief detective and he's wearing the night monkey mask. He's like, ah, night monkey and stuff like that. And so Peter goes out into the little town and borrows a guy's phone. He's like, these people are so nice. And he calls somebody um, and it's Happy Hogan and stuff. So, you know, Tony's jet comes and lands in a field of fucking tulips or whatever where Peter is and Happy gets out and he's like, Peter? And Happy's like, Happy, is that you? Which I fucking loved. Like he was mind fucked. And he's like, don't come any closer. Like it was, it was so fucking cool, man. The notion that he was scared because he doesn't know what's fucking real anymore. And for all he know, because when the illusion ended, another illusion started, and just when it looked like somebody was killed, they were alive. So he's all mind fucked, and so he don't know if Happy's happy, and he's like, tell me something only you would know. And Happy's like, you rented a fucking adult movie last time, like when we were in Berlin. He's like, all right, all right. So he jumps on the plane with him, and Happy's sewing Peter up, because he's been beaten up, and she got hit by a fucking train. And Peter gets a little pissy because it hurts. There's a really good moment where he goes, you know, fucking, I thought you had super strength. And he goes, it still hurts. I was such, it's still, and the delivery of Tom Holland's line where he's like, still hurts, like, was so fucking real. And it said so much where you're like, wow, man. So, like, it's one thing to have those superpowers, but, like, when he feels a hit, he feels a hit. Like, it still fucking hurts. And still he kind of goes through with it. A little tiny hero moment. And then he bitches out and starts yelling at Happy, like, ah. He's like, I fucking fucked up and Mr. Stark, blah, 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 and fucking trusted me and blah. And so, you know, that's where Favreau, who fucking hats off to this guy, he started all this shit, right? Like Iron Man, one of the best fucking movies ever made. He established with Kevin Feige the fucking Marvel Cinematic Universe. So to have him there, I, I'm, I so love that, like, they're bringing him back in and he's a major player now in these Spider Man movies and shit. Still a part of the universe because. He's the closest thing we got to Tony Stark at this point. He was tight with Tony, man, Pepper and, and him, the three of them. Um, so he says, you know, and it's heartbreaking. He's like, Tony Stark was my best friend. I'm going to cry. Tony Stark was my best friend. He's going, and he was a mess. And I was like, oh, my God, are they going to fucking touch on the alcoholism, which they did a little bit in, in Iron Man 2? In the comics, he was a fucking alcoholic, like Tony Stark. And Demon in a Bottle, very famous storyline. So to have him be like, to have him be like, he was, he, you know, he was all messed up. He was a mess. Like, I think for me, that includes the alcoholism. You know, I went with that in my mind. I was like, that's right. They're talking about even that. We saw all the heroic acts of Tony Stark and some slightly less heroic acts. But, you know, the character is incredibly fucking rich. Like, and, and that alcoholism thing, they did a little bit of it, but fucking runs deep in the history of that character. So, I mean, again, I, I'm not saying that's what they were saying, but for me, I was like, I took it. But I also just took Favreau, been there from the start. And he's like, Tony's my best friend. And he's like, but he was a mess. And he second-guessed himself all the time and whatnot. The one thing he never second-guessed himself about is you. 
And, you know, he's like, nobody expects you to be the next Iron Man. You just be fucking Spider-Man. And he chose you because he believed in you and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, so you're stranded. You're in the middle of nowhere. You ain't got a suit. What are you going to do? And, you know, he's fucking invoking Tony Stark. He's calling him up, man, because Tony was lost in the middle of nowhere in the desert without his fucking tech. And, and he built... Tony Stark built this in a cave! You know what I'm saying? So... Peter's like, I need a suit and fucking uh, Favs, um, Happy Hogan, like turns on the fucking tech and the fucking thing opens up and this is the moment in the movie that made me fucking cry. So, you know, the fucking the optics turn on, the holograms and shit and, and Peter's like, show me everything you got on Spider-Man and all the different Spider-Man suit designs are there. And so he pulls one, just the way Tony used to pull them in his lab and he pulls the hologram and he starts working with it and he's pulling all, he's like, lose this and he puts his hand through it like as if it's there the way like Tony did with the glove way back in the day. And they did that. And I was like, oh my God. And then they fucking cut to Favreau seeing it, which definitely nails home that he's having a fucking Tony Stark moment too. And that's what fucking breaks your heart in two, man. And then uh, he's like, you take care of the tech. I'll take care of the music. And he fucking puts on, um, bam, bam, bam. Ben puts on ACDC and fucking Peter's like, I love Led Zeppelin. Very funny. So Fav's got to turn that music on, which is very poetic because he turned that music on the first time too in Iron Man as the director. So uh, they're hovering above the tulip field now. They're building the suit. The suit's getting built and fucking, you know, uh, uh, um, Happy sends a coded message to uh, Nick Fury saying things may not be as they, things aren't as they appear or whatever. You know, letting him know that Mysterio is not his guy. Um, at one point, Mysterio, you know, they, they're, they're rushing to get to, where the, where's the fucker end? Oh, London, duh. They're rushing to get to London where the big thing is about to happen. And, uh, where Mysterio's next big fucking illusion is about to happen. And, um, the, uh, the, at one point, Mysterio is like, you know, f- fighting this fucking thing, comes up out of, you know, it's a giant fucking weather monster or some such shit. And he's like, you know, it's drawing. If it gets near this, it'll draw power and get bigger. And Nick Fury's watching this thing from a window and finally clicks his ear thing. He looks back at Maria Hill and he goes, now that's some bullshit. (laughs) Calls it for what it is. Nick Fury, playing the most Nick Fury version of Nick Fury that Nick Fury's ever been in this movie. Throughout the whole movie, you're like, wow, man, Sam just playing, Sam playing Nick Fury now. And then at the end, you realize what was going on. It's very fucking clever. Nothing bad about the performance whatsoever. It's good. Really good, but like you sit there going like, he's hitting some familiar notes, and then you realize why later on. So at this point, you don't know it and shit. Well, we talked about it earlier. Fucking Talos and his, and his wife were pretending to be Nick Fury and, and, uh, and Maria Hill the whole fucking time. They haven't been in the movie. We don't see Nick Fury in this movie until the post credit sequence when we see him up in space with the Skrull army. You know, where we, you know, fucking... So obviously, he went to the funeral, um, and then he fucked off with Captain Marvel because she was at the funeral too and they're still doing whatever they're doing up in space. At one point, we hear him say a line about like a Kree sleeper cell and you're like, holy shit, but that didn't really register until fucking later on. You're like, are they fucking laying seeds for the Kree scroll war? Fucking, I mean, Lord knows we saw that in Captain Marvel, but are they bringing it to Earth by saying sleeper cell? Like, what the fuck? So, but that's all I'm passing and shit. So now, Nick Fury's hyped to the fact, hip to the fact that Mysterio ain't what he says. We're seeing Quentin Beck like on this bridge away from the action. He's wearing a mocap suit with a giant dome on it. That's where Edith is now, not in a pair of glasses, but in this fucking dome. So he could control the thing. He controls it on his wrist gauntlet, all the different cameras, different um, drones and shit. Um, seeing him in the mocap suit is dope, but seeing him in that fucking bubble head, he's still fucking Mysterio. You know how clever that is? Even though he's not wearing the bubble head, he's wearing a fucking bubble head. So in the final act, there's a Mysterio and there's a Mysterio. The whole movie, we talked about it on Fat Man on Batman, really does harken back to Iron Man 3. Uh, and also, like every fucking Iron Man movie, harkens back to Tony Stark. Tony Stark created all of his fucking villains, including Mysterio. Like, once again, Tony is responsible. And the tech that's going to kill everybody, Edith, also created by fucking Tony. So even dead, he's the hero, but even dead, he's still the fuck up. He created all of the bad guys that he had to eventually fight and shit. Now he's created a bad guy that Peter's got to fight in his absence. So yeah, the movie rings very Iron Man 3. Um, in as much as in Iron Man 3, 
Uh, the, the Mandarin was not who the Mandarin was presented as. Mysterio is not who Mysterio is presented as. He's this fucking team of people and shit with all these drones. So Spider-Man has to jump. You know, he's, he's got a suit ready and shit. He's on the side of the plane with Happy. Happy, meanwhile, there's been a few moments where, like, fucking you could tell he likes Aunt May. And Spider-Man's like, when I get back, we're going to talk about you and May. And he jumps off the plane and fucking flying squirrels it down and shit and fucking lands, you know, uh, Nick Fury sees him land and, and he's going to dive right into the monster. So into the illusion. Peter's like, I got to get into the heart of the illusion, disable the fucking drones. They always set this shit up like a video game. So like if you're playing the game, they're like, here are the things you got to do. You got to get inside the monster. You got to shut down all the drones and you got blah, blah, blah. So they, they set up the tasks for us and Peter's about to do it. And he bursts inside and fucking, you know, Mysterio knows he's in there and Peter starts webbing up all the fucking drones and he rigged his fucking, uh, you know, webbing to carry a charge. So they shocks them all and the illusion starts fading. So the rest of the world, this illusion's attacking and the kids are on the fucking double-decker bus. Um, the screenwriter of Mysterio, like, was the guy who's driving the bus and shit and he locks him on the bus, real sinister and whatnot. Um... So the kids are in jeopardy. Mysterio is like, I've got to, where, he's like, show me my loose ends, Edith, and shows them all the pictures of like Nick Fury and Maria Hill and the kids. Those are the people he got to kill while this big monster event's going on. But meanwhile, Spider-Man's ruining the monster event and fucking you're seeing all the drones decloaked and Mysterio's like, decloak all the fucking drones. And, and William's like, what? And he's like, do it. And he's like, but people will see. He's like, they'll see what I want them to say. Like, he's just fucking nuts. So... Uh, Spider-Man, you know, uh, is fine. He's fighting the fucking drones and taking them out and shit like that. Meanwhile, there's one fucking drone that was ready to, like, right in front of Nick Fury, ready to kill him. But Maria Hill runs up a fucking tower with a fucking bazooka and shit. And as soon as all the drones uncloak, the one is right out in front of the window in front of Sam Jack, in front of Nick Fury, ready to blow him away. And he's like, you got me? And she's like, I got you. And she fucking blows the fucking drone out of the sky and shit. Maria Hill. So now Spider-Man got to, you know, do the, the big thing and take out fucking Quentin Beck, who's on the bridge. And he spots him through all the fucking atmosphere and shit. He's like, there you are, you son of a bitch. And he fucking goes in to this long bridge thing and, uh, you know, fucking grabs him and he's like, I got you. And he goes, well, it would seem you have me at a disadvantage. And then one of the drones fucking blows Peter to the other end of the hallway and shit. And then Mysterio goes for his fucking shit again, man, because he's got some drones left and the whole thing blacks out and he's going to fucking attack Peter in the dark because now he's the master of deception and Peter can't fucking see around him and shit like that. And that's when the Peter tingle kicks in, man. And you fucking you hear him. It's such a great sequence. You hear him go, like, breathe in and fucking Peter tingle it and shit. And then all of a sudden they do this dark hallway sequence where he has to take out, like, fucking, I don't know, 20 drones and shit to get to Mysterio. And it's done in flashes because it's a dark tunnel. And anytime he destroys a drone, it blows up. So you see it all in flashes. But it's all meant to be Peter using his spider sense to do it, which is a huge fucking beat in the movie man boom and he gets to the end and fucking you know the drones are like you know he's like fire everything and edith is like you we can't you're you're in the fucking strike zone and he's like i don't care so the drones are fucking firing like crazy and they've hit fucking quentin beck so he drops down and then peter takes out the last drone and fucking goes you know to confront quentin beck and shit like that and he's just like laying there all fucking busted up and like you got me kid kind of thing and you know, he's just like, you're a good guy, Peter. That's you're always going to be a problem. And so Peter wants the glasses. And so Mysterio goes to hand him the glasses. And then all of a sudden, poof, Peter like reaches off to the fucking side and you hear a gunshot. And he caught Mysterio's arm. He was going to shoot him in the fucking head. He was going to shoot this boy, this high school boy with a gun in his fucking head. I know like, you know, Peter Parker is dodging death left and right. But that really hit me. That impacted me. I was like, after all that, he was just going to fucking blow this kid's fucking brains out on this bridge. Like, this is nuts, man, these movies. So Peter caught it, and he's like, you can't fool me no more and shit. And then, ah, fucking puts a hurt on him. He goes down or whatever the fuck. So the guy on the ground was a fucking illusion. And this guy was ready to fucking kill Peter, but he caught it and shit. And then Peter's like, t- gets the glasses, put them on. He's like, Edith, execute all. She's like, kill, kill all the orders to, you know, fucking whatever the drones are doing. And she says, execute all. He says, yes, execute everything. 
execute all of them or whatever the fuck. So all the drones power down, go back up to the fucking satellite and shit like that. And uh, Quentin Beck dies, says some shit, and dies. And Peter uses the glasses, he goes, is he, is this real? And they're like, yeah. So I think he's dead. Some people are like, I don't think he's dead. But I think he's fucking dead. Um, but he don't have to be. I mean, if they want to do a Sinister Six, Mysterio could still be alive. It just doesn't have to be Jake Gyllenhaal, right? Because he died on the floor. Or it could be Jake Gyllenhaal. Or it could be Jake Gyllenhaal and say they reveal it's a fucking, you know, Ralphie from Christmas Story working the illusion. Like, you know, that's it. But they ain't going to touch this character again, I guarantee you, for a while because they're so deep bench over there, man. They never look backwards. They always fucking look forwards, man. So I can't imagine, unless they do a Sinister Six, which could be fucking Spider-Man 3, the next one, you know, far from fucked or whatever they want to call it, fucked at home, homeschooled. That's what you call it, Spider-Man, homeschooled. And a Sinister Six comes to fucking get him and shit like that. Because they've already set up Vulture. You got yourself Scorpion. Now you got a Mysterio. Um, who else you missing? I don't know. Three new ones they could add in this fucker in the new movie. So uh, everything working out fucking, uh, you know, well for Peter. Shit looks heroic and whatnot. Things look like they're coming in for a nice landing, as we said at the beginning. Um, and then all hell breaks loose. I'm not going to recover. recall that. We did that at the top. Remember, they get home. Fucking, you know, him and MJ kiss on the bridge. I should talk about that. After the fight, they have this really sweet high school fucking moment on the bridge where they have this conversation and kiss. And, you know, it's it's honestly like in a movie full of visual wonder um, and nonstop, like, uh, action and, and um, uh, you know, a, a high school patois, uh, the romance is sweet. Like, it makes, you, makes your heart beat a little bit. It, you know, makes you well up. Makes you remember a time when fucking you were young and everything. And even though this kid just went through fucking hell on earth, kissing MJ is the greatest adventure of his life up until that point. So they nail that, man, as well. And then, you know, get him to Newark and fucking let him swing through the city. It ends with them swinging through the city, picks up MJ, and they go swinging, like, through Manhattan, um, which is really fun and, and visually interesting and breathtaking. And then cut to those cool credits they do, and then cut to the mid-credit sequence where they fucking wreck shop. Oh my God, it's unfucking believable So, love this movie, love the performances. Once again, Tom Holland, fantastic. Uh, Jacob, the kid who plays Ned, is great. Zendaya, Zendaya, wonderful. Um, the, uh, the, all the kids, Betty, the kid who plays Flash, is a real piss, piece of shit. I hope they're setting him up to be a bad guy. Like, maybe low-key, right? Like, you know, like, they show him, his mom not and his dad not picking him up at the airport, but, like, his driver picking him up. And it was such a weird, like, like, why do you include that unless that's going to be useful for later on? You know what I'm saying? Like, you definitely don't need to be like... And his parents still don't care for him. You know, that's not really a part of the story. But it's in there, and I don't think they do anything accidentally. As we saw, barf was not just something to open Civil War. It was the entire fucking plot of Spider-Man Far From Home, like that technology. So I, I would keep an eye on fucking Flash Thompson if I were you. Um, the teachers, J.B. Smoove and Martin Starr were great. Um, uh, Nick Fury, who we find out in the, in, in the tail credits, is not Nick Fury, but Talos. Uh, both of them were great. Uh, uh, Colby Smolders, smoldering as always. Uh, she was wonderful. Um, but man, the fucking... MVP of this motherfucker is definitely Tom Holland. But right next to him, shoulder to shoulder, Jake Gyllenhaal. And it's really sweet because Jake Gyllenhaal at one point almost paid, played Spider-Man back in the day. So he got to be in a Spider-Man movie and do something wholly original. Like, you know, I'm not taking anything away from anybody, but if you have the choice between being one of 12 people that paid, played Spider-Man and the only person that played Mysterio, the way is clear. Um, so he did a phenomenal fucking job. Human... Um, and a, it's a performance within a performance. It's like the sting. Really great fucking stuff, man, across the boards. This was a tough act to follow, Spider-Man Homecoming. Michael Keaton was so amazing in that fucking scene when he turned around, and he's like, I will kill you in the car and shit. That was dope. And plus, it's just his outfit was fantastic. They made the vulture like work and make sense. They fucking doubled up with, with, with Mysterio and delighted this age-old fucking Mysterio fan who got to see his hero up on the big screen and shit like that. With the fishbowl and all, man. If they did this shit in the 90s or the aughts, he would have had like a fucking mask or some such shit. But they gave him the fucking plow to fishbowl, man. It was fantastic. Um, 
Love the movie. Obviously. Go see it, man. Uh, it is, it's everything a movie's supposed to be. I see a movie like this, it makes me ashamed that I call myself a filmmaker because I'm like, man, I don't do that. I don't do that. I don't take people on journeys of wonder and shit like that. Hats off to John Watts. Hats off to uh, the, all the screenwriters. There's four names. And as a writer, I should memorize them all. Um, but they did a fucking great job. Maybe there's only two names. I forget. But a, a fantastic script across the boards. Uh, Amy Pascal, Kevin Feige, all those cats involved. Um, man, it, it, it's, it's not far. F- Sp- Spider-Man. Far from home, but not far from my heart. <laughs> there it is. Uh, thanks, man. Don't forget uh, me at Hall H coming up at San Diego Comic Con. And uh, soon you're going to see seeing a trailer for Jay and Silent Bob reboot, man. A far uh, a, a less webby movie than Spider Man Far From Home. Um, and far less expensive as well. Boy, we had no money. They have all the money. And it shows. They use every fucking dollar well up on that screen. Whatever it cost, I, I, I wholeheartedly applaud whatever they spent making this movie. This movie made me so happy. So happy I went to see it fucking twice. I'll probably see it another time. Joy. That's what they're minting over the Marvel factory, man. Here's some fucking joy. Isn't it marvelous? Yes, it is. Uh, there it is, man. Uh, that's That was the very first Silent Bob Speaks, but seeing how chatty I like to be, you can fucking be assured it's not the last. So this is Kevin Smith for Silent Bob Speaks. Until next time. Trademark Kevin Smith. <laughs>